All right, welcome back, back class. Here we are in our penultimate lecture. Last week, we switched gears a little bit, moving away from the Ising model and theory of criticality that we had worked so hard to develop, having found a reasonable set of solutions, both analytically and RG and numerically with Monte Carlo. Hopefully you all are enjoying really digging into the Monte Carlo aspect of that solution in your, in your homework this week. So we set the stage last lecture to consider the liquid state, the phase of matter we have so far largely neglected due to its complications. A liquid is, some, is a state of matter for which both energetic and entropic considerations play an equal role. And thus is very different from gases whose entropic effects are easy to count. And we considered those at the very beginning of class or even solids, which at least at low temperature, energetic contributions dominate and we're able to make simple forms and guesses for how those simple effective potentials look like and what they are imply for the statistics of that state. But here in the context of liquids, we've had to develop some slightly different sets of perspectives, some different ways of thinking about a liquid and the structure and how that structure was related, the structure of a liquid is related to its thermodynamics in order to really proceed given the complexity afforded by the interacting, you know, many interacting particles in such a state of matter. So today what we're going to do is we're going to first revisit some of those basic uh, definitions we constructed last lecture, notions of pair correlation functions, the radial distribution function, notions of translational symmetry and how just the density at some arbitrary spatial point leads to very little information being conveyed. And we'll then show how that radial distribution function in cases of fluids describable by pairwise additive interactions, what that means will become clear in a moment, how that radial distribution function there in such cases really contains all of the thermodynamic information that one needs to describe the state of the system. So specifically we'll relate things like the average energy or the internal pressure of a fluid to simple quantities or integrals over those pair distribution functions, that radial distribution function in particular. With those sorts of relationships in hand, we will employ some of the approximate techniques we established in our discussion of the Ising model to derive a equation of state for a fluid, at least a fluid that is weakly interacting, so not so dense, which is an equation state you all are familiar with. It's the so-called Van der Waals equation. We know that it's something that can predict, at least in some sense, the properties of a vapor, maybe the properties of a liquid, and with some corrections, the transition between a liquid and its vapor. So that's where we'll aim to get to in this lecture. Before we go there, let's remind ourselves of those definitions we laid down last time. So specifically, one of the things we noted was that a fluid, be it a liquid or its vapor, a defining characteristic of such a state is that it has translational symmetry. In words, what that means is that if I look at any point in a container that contains a fluid, statistically, the properties at that point are the same as if I looked at any other point. That if I translate around the container, expectation values that are local, say what the density is or what the energy is, what the pressure is, are the same. If you 
stood on top of a molecule, what this would mean is that irrespective of where that molecule is in space, its environment would look the same. That's what it means in words. In equations, if we were to compute the average density at some point in space R, the microscopic definition for which we've elaborated on as a sum over all the particles from one to n and delta functions locating the instantaneous positions of all n particles. The average, therefore, is just the thermal expectation value over that sum of delta functions as a sum averaging commutes with such an object. So I can take that average inside, and if all the particles are the same, I'll have just n copies of the average of the delta function for one of those particles, less that its position away from r. Translational invariance means that that average, the average, so delta function binary variable has zero if the argument is not satisfied and one if it is once integrated over. As an average of a binary variable, it has an interpretation as a probability. So what that really is saying is the probability that particle i is at location r. If we have translational invariance, that probability is just one over v, the volume of the box. Multiplying that by the n factors we got from our sum gives us just rho outside of the thermal expectation, which we will mean to be the bulk density. Just the number density of the fluid, how many particles per volume there are. So that's mathematically what we mean by the statement fluids have translational invariance, that if I look at the density at one point in space, I get back just the bulk density. That complicated our description of fluids last lecture because it told us that if we wanna understand the structure of a liquid, say, that we have to look at a more complicated function of the density rather than just its average value. And so we motivated and then elaborated upon a notion of pair correlations or conditioned densities to elucidate the structure of a liquid. We formulated a specific sort of conditioned expectation value as asking what is the density at some point, say R prime, given there is a particle, say particle one at R zero. If I necessitate that there is a particle at the origin, now I've broken translational invariance by that act of conditioning. The density will respond reflective of the correlations between particles under that constraint. That's a very fancy way of saying that if I put a particle at the origin, I know at a minimum that there's not gonna be a particle on top of it. So there must be a correlation between where particles are given that particle is placed in that specific location. Now fluid, because it has translational invariance, 
those it, for a fluid, those correlations won't persist indefinitely. If I look really, really far, macroscopically far away from the origin, I should have no information contained in the fluid. There should be only bulk density returned, but close enough, say right on top of it, maybe a few molecular diameters away, I can probably construct a function which, which contains those correlations, that information about the conditioning that I've imposed. And specifically, we can ask just then about the density, say rho of r, given some particle is at the origin, call it particle one. That conditioning, a conditioned probability has, can always be written in the form of a joint probability, say the probability that R1 is at the origin and R2 is at R divided by its marginal probability, just the probability that R1 is at the origin in times that joint probability is thus the density or has an interpretation of the density of particles at R. And so this is a way to write out that condition probability. And we use that to define a function, the G of R, the radial distribution function, which factors out the bulk density and thus encodes the deviations of the density field under the constraint of the conditioning that build up in its response. So this G of R radial distribution function is one for a system that has no correlations. It is a series of delta functions for something like a crystal and for something like a vapor, we worked out last lecture that it's something that looks just like the Boltzmann factor given some pair interaction potential U of R. In general, we showed some examples of what to expect that radial distribution function to look like. Let's be fancy and copy this a couple of times for consistency. All right. So we can compare what we expect the radial distribution function to look like for a liquid, a vapor, and a solid all at finite temperature. It's constructed such that for a system that has no correlations, it plateaus to one. So that's a useful reference to note on the y-axis, a useful scale to refer to on the x-axis. Let's call it sigma, the particle diameter for some simple fluid. Now for an ideal gas, the G of R would be strictly one because an ideal gas lacks correlations. But for an actual vapor, given the relationship up here, it says that the G of R will be proportional to a Boltzmann factor. For 
a interaction potential like what we might expect, something that is dispersive at long range and excludes volume at short range, we might expect that G of R to look something like that. Not a lot of amplitude past sigma, but goes to zero for R's smaller than sigma. For a crystal, we'll expect to find one big peak at sigma. That's not a delta function as long as we're away from zero temperature. The packing of something like hexagonal closed pack gives rise to this shoulder and those peaks will oscillate with varying intensities for all R because the crystal retains correlations macroscopically far away. A liquid is essentially something in between. There's a depletion zone for R less than sigma. And then I have oscillations reflective of different solvation shells around a tagged particle that essentially go like multiples of sigma. So that's what we argued radial distribution functions should look like based on kind of physical principles of packing. I think it's worth actually seeing that that is in fact borne out. So let's actually take that hard sphere molecular dynamic simulation code we've played around a couple played around with a couple times in class and actually try to compute the radial distribution function. And let's do that for a vapor and a liquid and see if these kind of pictures are really what we find. Okay, so let's start with the vapor first. So here I am, there's, there's a hard sphere molecular dynamics code. I'm gonna start it at a fairly low density, 25 on, over 144, close to a density, essentially close to a density of 0.1. This is you know, reasonably consistent with a vapor, though it's a little denser than what might expect typical vapor to be. Go ahead and run this. I'll start it out on lattice. So I guess the density is closer to 0.5. So running this, you know, hopefully this doesn't give you any epileptic fits. It's moving pretty quickly. There's very few particles. There's a lot of space in between them. So they move ballistically. So they advance to many different patterns very rapidly. But because there is so few particles, we actually need a fairly long simulation in order to be able to converge the statistics because there's not so many pairs to average over. It's not so likely to find two particles close together. But indeed, when we compute the pair correlation function, the radial distribution function, we find exactly what we expected. Something that goes to one, has a depletion zone, and maybe has a little bit of intensity at distances a little past one that are a little higher in amplitude than exactly one. It's a little jaggedy, essentially reflecting that even that length of a simulation doesn't really have enough statistics to converge it quite well. Okay, so that's a vapor that can you know that confirms our intuition. It looks about like we expected it to. Let's now check out the liquid. So I'm going to run this now at a density of 0.84, this is pretty close to the triple point density, essentially what we think about as a liquid state. There are many more particles, obviously. They're packed in pretty close proximity to each other. There, again, there's big time lags between each frame so that I can sample over many different configurations. Again, I need to run this long enough to be able to compute that pair correlation function, which is in general going to require many more statistics than a single point average might. If I wanted to just confirm that the average density was uniform, that's something that would converge a lot more quickly 
then asking about a pair correlation function, I need to be able to ask about the value of that G of R at a variety of different displacement distances up to say half of the box length. So I need to have many, many realizations in order to see enough signal to distinguish that from the noise, just the fluctuations in the density that occur due to thermal fluctuations. But indeed, if we look at the G of R, it looks really pretty good, right? There's a big peak right about one. We see oscillations past one at multiples of sigma. And if we go far enough, in this case, four is essentially far enough, it plateaus to one. The amplitude of that first peak in this case, a little greater than 2.5. With the equations we wrote out last lecture, you could convert that given the density into a typical neighbor number, typical number of particles in the sol first solvation shell of a tagged fluid particle. But I think this is sufficient to then you know, tell you that this kind of expectation that we argued for last lecture really is borne out in a simple fluid, something like liquid argon, which you know, a hard sphere is not an unreasonable model for. Okay. All right, so that's essentially where we've been. So now let's actually talk a little bit about how we can convert that radial distribution function into properties, thermodynamic properties that we might care about. So how can we relate structure to thermodynamics or how does, how is structure encoded in thermodynamics and vice versa? How, is, how are thermodynamics encoded in the structure? Okay, so let's think of a, a somewhat simplified case. Let's consider a system of n particles. that are all the same. That are all classical. And that interact with a pair potential U2. which just depends on the distance between those pairs of particles. What that means mathematically is that I could write down the total potential energy associated with a configuration of particles as one half, a sum over all pairs, I and J, this pair potential U2, which depends on the magnitude of the displacement between particles I and J. So this is a good model for something like argon. The total potential is decomposable into a sum of pairwise functions, where we'll introduce some notation. Let's call the magnitude of the vector Ri minus Rj as Rij. And for completeness, let's differentiate those i's and j's with vector hats. OK, so what might a pair potential look like for something like argon. We've argued this last lecture. So argon 
should have some finite range of interactions. So at large distances, particles shouldn't interact. At really short distances, they should repel. And at intermediate distances, there should be some dispersive interaction due to induced dipole-induced dipole interactions associated with the polarizability of something like argon. That's the highest order multipole, which is non-vanishing for something like argon. This would be very different if we're talking about ions with total charges or point dipoles. But for something like argon, the leading order term is its dispersion interactions. So dispersion, you all know, goes like r to the sixth. Let's set the crossover between where those dispersive interactions and the exclusion interactions, the volume exclusion forces dominate sigma. So we expect to have some potential that maybe looks like this. Let's denote the depth of this potential as minus sigma. And we might expect that the poly exclusion maybe goes exponential. due to wave function overlap. Okay, so that might be what we have in mind as an effective pair potential for something like argon. Indeed, this specific form would have a name. It's the so-called Buckingham potential form, modification of maybe something that's better known, so-called Leonard Jones potential. If we have a pairwise decomposable potential, we can think about computing things like the average energy. So the total energy of the system of argon atoms is its kinetic energy plus its potential energy on average one of those we know how to compute very simply the kinetic energy as a system of classical identical particles will obey equipartition if there are n particles and three dimensions. Equipartition tells us that each one of those degrees of freedom will contribute one half kBT to the average energy. And that will be independent of whether or not this system is dense like a fluid or dilute like a vapor. The average potential, however, is not so obvious how we compute it. It's unlikely we will be able to solve for the partition function of this system and thus just take a derivative, find its dependence on beta. So we need to adopt a different strategy. So the average potential of our pairwise additive fluid can be written as one half sum over all pairs. And bring the average inside. Now we average u2 of r i j.
Again, if all the particles are the same, this is one half n times n minus one. That's how many pairs there are. Average u2 pick out one of those pairs to average because they're all identical. So now we've at least gotten rid of the sum. Can we go any further? Well, let's introduce what will look on its face like a complication. If we had u2 of r, say prime, we could write that as an integral over r, u2 of r times a delta function that gives us back one if r is equal to r prime. Now that seems like a, a silly thing to do. We've replaced one simple expression for the potential with something that on its face looks more complicated. But let's see what happens if we do that. You know, this is essentially just a property of the delta function. So we have one half n times n minus one. Let's introduce this delta function. Now, u2 here is under the expectation value. So let's make sure to leave that expectation value there. We wanna introduce a delta function that is one if the magnitude of ri, r1 less r2 is equal to r. Such that when we integrate over r, we will get back u2 average of r12 back. Now note. The fluctuating quantities in this system are the positions of the particles. The positions of the particles here are in this delta function. So rewriting it in this form has localized the piece that fluctuates into that delta function while u2 of r, r is just a dummy variable, this is just a function. Something that does not fluctuate, which means that we can pull it out of the average. So we have factors of n and two, u2 of r, and an average of this delta function. Now let's simplify. First, if n is large, n minus one is essentially n. If the system is a fluid, it has translational invariance. It doesn't really matter where each particle is exactly in space, just where they are relative to each other. So I am free to put particle one wherever is most convenient, say at the origin 
If I place it at the origin, I'll denote that choice with that subscript. I'm thus averaging the delta function of r less r2 given or conditioned on r1 being at the origin. That is, now we recognize, a factor of 1 by n rho and r radial distribution function, or g of r. So what we've just succeeded in doing without any approximation other than setting n minus 1 to n and noting translational invariance is to be able to rewrite the average potential energy of the system as a factor of rho n by 2. This integral is over vector r if u2 just depends on the distance between particles, as our pair potential does, not their orientation relative to each other. I can integrate out the angles in three dimensions. That will give me a factor of 4 pi. I'll have an integral from 0 to infinity r squared from the Jacobian, the g of r, and u2 of r. So we have just now linked the structure as encoded by the radial distribution function to thermodynamics, in this case, the average energy. And it's important to remember that that g of r, while not clear in this notation, is an average. It is the structure on average. It's the relative structure between two particles. It's the correlations between two particles. Also, this clarifies that the average potential energy is proportional to n which means that it's extensive as long as that pair potential goes to zero faster than one over r squared. If the g of r at really large distances goes to one, then that integral will converge provided u2 goes to zero faster than r squared, the thing multiplying it up in front. Hmm. So this is something we've brought up a number of times before, but didn't really have the mathematics to state explicitly that some systems, like those that interact with bare Coulomb potentials or that interact through gravitational forces are not extensive. They require some nuance in describing their thermodynamics. Okay, but we don't need to get into that. So that's the average energy. There are many similar relationships whereby a thermodynamic quantity can be written as an integral over the g of r in the limit that particles interact only through pairwise additive forces. Another example would be the pressure. Turns out beta P as given by the derivative of the Helmholtz free energy with respect to volume, holding temperature and number of particles fixed, can be written as rho, that's what you'd have in an ideal gas, times beta 
row squared, factor of six, an integral over vector r, r dotted into the pair force weighted by the g of r. Again, the g of r essentially tells you the probability of finding particles at a relative distance between them. So it makes some sense that the pressure is just the weighted force weighted over the probability of finding particles at those displacement distances. This is in another exact expression provided particles interact pairwise. It's known as the so-called virial equation. And should be noted again that the G of R is an average, so you can't know the G of R at only one thermodynamic state point and extract the pressure at all thermodynamic state points. If I wanted to know the pressure at one temperature or the other, the G of R has to encode that change in condition also. But provided you have the G of R, you can predict what the pressure is. Now I've stressed this point a couple times already that, uh, that these are exact relationships provided particles interact pairwise. That is sufficient for model systems, but in reality you might expect that there can be three body interactions, at least quantum mechanically, if I have three argon atoms actually sitting in a box, I can have dipole, 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 induced dipole, induced dipole, induced dipole, higher order multipole excitations, and thus have three body non-additive contributions to the total energy, but typically those contributions are pretty small, which is why simplified approximations to the potential that break it down into pairwise additive forms work to model such systems. And provided that model, these are exact relationships between its thermodynamics and its structure. And in this case, we found if we knew the G of R and how it would say depend on temperature and pressure, we could compute the equation of state of a fluid. Note also that this is all true for fluids. The pair distribution function is insufficient to describe a crystal because a crystal has orientations as well as spatial correlations. But this brings us into the final point for today, which is to take this insight that structure encodes thermodynamics and actually try to derive an equation of state that is typically just phenomenologically posited or told to you that works pretty well. Something we have invoked a couple of times in this course, the so-called van der Waals gas. <laughs> 
So this is something now we're in a position to actually see systematically kind of where it comes from. And it's a nice calculation to go through because it will invoke a number of approximations we've seen in the context of phase transition, where we tried to approximate other interacting models. Okay, so the equation is state. Van der Waals equation tells you that beta pressure is equal to rho divided by a factor of one less an empirical parameter B times the density. That parameter is positive. So it means that the density essentially looks larger than I would have expected for an ideal gas. Those are the results of volume exclusion effects that are not contained in the ideal gas that would serve to increase the pressure beyond the neglect of correlations in such a case. In fact, as the factor B times rho goes to one, the pressure diverges, essentially saying that the particles will become incompressible or the system composed of those volume excluding particles will become incompressible. So indeed that's where the repulsion of particles lie. But in addition, the Van der Waals equation has another term, minus a times rho squared, given a is also a positive parameter. That tells you that the pressure is reduced by some factor that goes like the density squared. So negligible at low density, but at higher densities can become important, that it is reducing the pressure reflects the attractive interactions that cause particles to clump together, reducing the pressures out on the exteriors of the vessel. Both are zero in an ideal gas. And we have seen what these sorts of curves look like. Say beta pressure in the inverse density plane, this is so a specific volume plane at high temperature. These are pretty smooth curves. At low temperature, they develop inflections. And at even lower temperature, they generate a physical properties that are fixed up with a Maxwell construction, invoking coexistence between a vapor here at low density and a liquid here at high density. So this is the direction of increasing temperature. So if one was being optimistic, you would say that in conjunction with the Maxwell construction, this model can predict liquid vapor coexistence. If you're being pessimistic, you would still note that the Van der Waals equation lets you extend an equation of state beyond those conditions where the ideal gas limit really breaks down. So slightly higher densities and slightly lower temperatures than where the ideal gas equation is strictly valid. So this is something we want to try to uncover where it comes from. And there's essentially two factors we'll need to sort out. This A factor where the attractions live and this B factor where the repulsions must live. 
So let's consider the partition function of n classical indistinguishable particles interacting with those pairwise additive potentials. So let's call that partition Q. It's a natural function of the number of particles, the volume that they're in, and temperature. So we'll consider it in the canonical ensemble. If they're indistinguishable, there will be a factor of one over n factorial. If I'm gonna count them in a resolution informed by quantum mechanics, I'll have three n factors, the Planck's constant, three n integrals over space, and three in integrals over momentum. The spatial integrals are weighted by their Boltzmann factor associated with the potential energy and those over the momentum weighted by the kinetic energy. Now the kinetic energy integrals can all be done. Those are all Gaussian integrals separable and yield our thermal wavelength. And remaining those spatial integrals over the interactions with don't factorize. Now let's take that kind of model we had for our simple fluid like argon seriously and simplify it a little bit further. Let's say that that potential has two components, a repulsive component and an attractive component. Let's denote the repulsive component subscript HC for hard core. And the attractive part as delta u. Thus the potential is decomposed into a separable repulsion and attraction. Let's imagine that each are pairwise additive such that I can write the hardcore repulsions as the sum over all pairs, little u, hc, r, i, j, and the attractive bits, double sum over little delta u. Now that hard core will envision as being 
and infinite repulsion. Something that has an infinite potential energy if R is less than sigma. And is zero otherwise. The attractive potential, let's imagine, has a scale epsilon and finite range. Maybe let's imagine that this is something like argon, where it is zero for R less than sigma and minus epsilon r in units of sigma to the one sixth for r greater than sigma. So the potential is separable spatially into an infinite repulsion at short range and a longer range attraction. So if this is how particles interact, we know that computing Q exactly would be hard, if not impossible. So we need an approximation. Now, looking at that potential, the hardcore part is zero or infinity. That doesn't sound like a small perturbation. So perturbation theory for it is probably not going to fly. However, if we imagine that epsilon is a small number, perhaps delta u could be treated perturbatively. So we might adopt a strategy where we treat the hardcore repulsions at one level of theory, say with, we can't treat it exactly either, but maybe we can treat it with mean field theory, not assuming that it's small. And then on top of that, treat delta U with a perturbation theory, assuming it is small. Okay, so let's see how that would play out. So that'll be our strategy. We'll treat delta u as a perturbation theory on top of a mean field theory treatment for the hardcore repulsion. So we know how this will go. We can write out that partition function as we had previously. We can separate out those factors of the hardcore repulsion from the attraction. We can define a system with just hardcore repulsions. <laughs> 
with its associated partition function and multiplying by one and noting the averaging operation embedded in that denominator and that numerator arrive at a relationship for the total partition function as the hardcore partition function times an average of the Boltzmann operator for the attractive part, averaged in the ensemble generated by hardcore repulsions. So now we have two things we need to do. We need to try to uh, find a way to evaluate the hardcore partition function. And then we will use perturbation theory to correct it with that second term. So let's get some intuition for what that hardcore repulsion piece looks like. In the absence of any interactions, that QHC would be simple. So if we turned the hardcore repulsions off, those integrals would be over an n-dimensional volume just of one. So we'd have V to the N in units of the, <coughs> excuse me, thermal wavelength and a factor of indistinguishability. where the temperature dependence comes from that thermal wavelength. And these factors of the integral, factors of the volume just come from the integrals over space. That's not exactly the system we have but it gives us some intuition because in the system with hardcore interactions, e to the beta little u hc of r is either one if r is less than sigma or zero else. It has no temperature dependence and is essentially just counting up all the volume available for particles to explore. The spatial integrals are weighted either by one if there are no overlaps between particles and zero if there are. Pictorially, in the dilute limit, let's pull out a little volume of particles. No, it's in the vapor. So maybe I have a particle there and I have a particle here, dilute limit there likely to be spaced far apart, but even in the dilute limit, there's some chance particles come close together. For this snapshot of particles, the volume accessible to another one is going to be, so if I tried to put myself in the vicinity of this tagged particle, it excludes a volume, which is four pi sigma cubed over three, because it by itself takes up that much space relative to the, where I can place the center of the other particle. 
That's because a new tagged particle can only get a sigma distance close to that particle. In cases where two particles are close together, that volume exclusion is much more complicated because it's going to depend on how particles pack to with respect to each other. But if the particles are dilute, those are probably negligible. So maybe let's try to ignore it. In general, that interpretation of the integrals over the hard color repulsion is some available volume to the n. And in the limit that the system is dilute, we might imagine that the excluded volume due to the hard cores is additive. That's essentially the mean field assumption. If we imagine fixing all of the particles, the volume available to an additional particle is approximated as V less n times the volume excluded by one of those particles, four pi sigma cubed divided by three, or some little v. That's essentially saying that there's only one kind of environment for which a particle excludes volume, which is not exactly true. There are gonna be fluctuations by which multiple particles get close together at the same time. So this is where the mean field approximation comes in, essentially saying that we're gonna treat all particles the same. Therefore, the partition function in the hardcore system, rather than being v to the n, is v minus this little v times n to the n, counted in units of the thermal wavelength and divided by n factorial for the indistinguishability of the particles. Now, in a systematic mean field theory, one would note that this little v is, in principle, a function of rho. But we will be neglecting that. So we will not be enforcing the self-consistency in this approximation or at least in this treatment. Okay, so that's the hardcore partition function. The free energy of the whole system is thus approximated as minus KBT log Q or beta A 
is going to be log the hardcore partition function plus log the expectation value over the correction evaluated in the hardcore partition, hardcore ensemble. Assuming that delta u is small, to first order, sorry, minus, it will be just beta times the average energy, attractive energy in that hardcore system. Now from our previous result above, the average energy can be written as an integral over the G of R factors of R squared we get a row in N, a two and a pi. Then to evaluate this, One needs the G of R for this hardcore partition function because that's where that average is living. Let's go ahead and turn this. Black. And let's denote this the hardcore G of R. And in the dilute limit, as we just found in the simulation, we expect this to be zero for R less than sigma and pretty close to one for R greater than sigma. That's exactly that Boltzmann factor, which is a good approximation for the radial distribution function in the dilute limit. which means now that that integral can be computed. It will return just some number. So we have row n integral sigma to infinity r squared past sigma, the g of r is just one. So we have just minus epsilon sigma over r to the sixth. So we get a an integral that's not so complicated to do. We'll get so we have a, a two and a pi, a row and an n, a minus epsilon, a sigma to the sixth, and an integral from sigma to infinity. 1 over r to the fourth. <clears throat> 
which is equal to, that's an easy integral to do, gives me a factor of one third, the, bound, the condition at the upper end of that function is zero. And so I evaluate it at the lower boundary only, and then it gives me sigma cubed. So I get two pi, I have three factors that cancel, sigma cubed, I have a minus, an epsilon, a rho, and an n. over three. So something proportional to epsilon, proportional to n, and to rho. All right. So we have explicit forms for both pieces of this free energy. If we want the equation of state, one needs to say for the pressure, take that free energy function and find its derivative with respect to volume. That's just the thermodynamic definition of the pressure. So beta P is equal to D dV log the hard core piece is V minus a little V in raised to the N factors that won't contribute plus D D V. If we put in what we mean by rho as N over V, we have factors Sorry, that should be not a negative. Epsilon is defined as less than zero. So we have two pi sigma cubed by three. We have an n over v squared. So those are both derivatives that are easy to take. In the first one, we'll get n outside. The derivative of the log brings down a v minus little v times n. Second one, v downstairs. Sorry, one factor of v, two factors of n. That brings me down a, a negative a two pi sigma cubed over three epsilon. And now I have n over v quantity squared. If we define B as that little volume, which was four pi sigma cubed over three and A as beta epsilon. Sorry, I should have had a factor of beta here beta epsilon by two, uh, four pi sigma cubed over three. Then what I can find is that beta pressure is rho one minus B rho minus A rho squared. Let's bring these down here. So we have indeed just gotten the van der Waals equation state, which is pretty cool, and identified what those phenomenological parameters really mean. B really is the volume that a particle excludes. A 
is the volume of the particle times its effective interaction depth, how sticky it is. A is a explicit function of the temperature. B within our treatment is just a constant. All right, so let's go ahead and leave it there for today. So we've employed quite a lot to get this result. We've gotten, we've gotten, we've come all the way from a understanding of the relationship between structure and thermodynamics as encoded by the radial distribution function. And we've then employed a number of tricks like mean field theory and thermodynamic perturbation theory to actually get at an effectively a pretty complicated equation of state, something that in principle encodes things like liquid vapor coexistence that works for even dense vapors and can be pushed even to fluids, to, to liquids. By arriving at it in this way, you can see how you might go beyond the van der Waals equation state. One could go to higher order expansions in that perturbation theory. One can develop more systematic ways of approximating the G of R away from the dilute limit. Or adding up the accessible volume that particles exclude away from those cases where neglecting non-additivity breaks down. All right. So that's all I have for you today. In fact, it's really all I have for you for the course. I will give a brief lecture for Thursday's course where I essentially step back and discuss kind of where we've been, kind of give you an overview of the sorts of things that we've learned and where StatMech might be headed. And also, you know, what sorts of things would be covered in the advanced class next spring. So stay tuned for that. That'll be the last lecture. Also, one quick announcement. Please do uh, fill out the evaluations. I think you were sent those a few days ago. I take them very seriously. I, I take a lot from them. So if you haven't already done so, please do fill out your evaluations uh, for the course. All right. Hope everyone is safe. And I'll see you in the live session.